Welcome to our presentation titled Naloxone, the, the Gift of Time. I'm Dr. Robin Mormon Lee, Clinical Associate Professor with the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. I also work with the PAMI team at UF Health Jacksonville, who is partnered with the Florida Blue Foundation. Our objectives for this lecture include describe the current national overdose concerns associated with opioids, identify signs and symptoms of opioid overdose, identify proper candidates for naloxone, list to describe the available naloxone formulations, including proper administration techniques, demonstrate the ability to properly counsel patients and caregivers on naloxone use, describe the current naloxone laws and how these laws are directed at improving patient access to naloxone. In pain management, we have various steps which are taken to develop a proper treatment plan since each patient experiences pain differently and the response to treatment regimens vary as well. Completing a full assessment of the reported pain symptoms and treatment options utilized in the past is vital when developing a new treatment plan. Many treatment plans will include a combination of non-pharmacological, non-opioid, and adjuvant options. There are certain times when a patient is determined to be a proper candidate for an opioid trial. When this occurs, there are many steps which must be taken to assure opioids continue to be a proper and safe option. In select cases, opioids have proven to be beneficial as part of the multimodal treatment plan. When opioids are considered a proper treatment option, constant monitoring and continued reevaluation of the risks and benefits of this therapy should be completed. Along with this, it is vital as healthcare providers, we continue to educate our patients on the safe use, proper storage, and disposal of these agents. Screening and education on side effects associated with opioids should be given even with our patients who have been taking these medications for an extended period of time. For anyone who is currently taking an opioid or has a loved one who is taking an opioid, education on signs of an opioid overdose should be covered on a regular basis. Despite careful dosing, proper education, and careful monitoring, there is always a risk that something can go wrong. As I always think about it is that if someone is taking an opioid, there's always a risk of an opioid overdose. The typical signs associated with an opioid overdose include unusual drowsiness, unable to wake with loud voices or a firm sternal rub. You can observe that the body is limp, the skin appears pale and or clammy to the touch, the fingernails of the lips have a blue cast, and the patient could have pinpoint pupils. The patient could be vomiting or making gurgling sounds, or breathing is very slow, shallow, or has stopped. Opioid-induced respiratory depression is when breathing has slowed dramatically or has altogether stopped when a patient is taking opioids. Opioids can suppress respiratory rate, tidal volume, and decrease responsiveness to both hypercapnia and hypoxia. The risk of opioid-induced respiratory depression occurring increases with opioid abuse, overdose, concomitant use of illicit substances, alcohol, and agents which are CNS depressants such as benzodiazepines. The process of opioid-induced respiratory depression will progress from respiratory depression to hypoxia, then brain damage, coma, and then possibly death. As you see, this is a graph from the CDC showing the national drug overdose deaths uh, from 1999 up to 2018. Unfortunately, over the years, we have seen an upward trend in opioid overdoses, although we do see a little bit of a decrease recently, which is hopeful. There have been various waves seen within the opioid overdose deaths. Wave one started around 1999, which includes the rise of prescription opioid overdose deaths. As you can see by the purple line, in general, it continues to rise with some minor recent decreases. The second wave included a rise in heroin overdose deaths, which started around 2010. Again, this has continued to rise as we saw a new wave, which was an increase of the synthetic opioid deaths. This includes fentanyl, either prescribed, but more commonly, it is the illicit manufactured fentanyl, as well as some of the other synthetic products, such as carfentanil, that caused the problem. 
Fentanyl is approximately 100 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more potent than heroin. In 2013, approximately 3,000 deaths were attributed to synthetic opioids such as fentanyl. And by 2018, these types of products accounted for up to or over 30,000 deaths. Many overdoses will include multiple substances, so it is always difficult to try and pinpoint exactly what's going on with the various opioids and these other substances. This graph from the CDC shows trends in the various substances, and you will see prescription opioids have basically stayed about stable with some decreases recently. Synthetic opioids, particularly fentanyl, has shown a sharp increase over the years. Patients are not just dying for prescription opioids and or synthetic fentanyl. Overdoses involving heroin also have to be considered, and it is again clear the trend of heroin and the synthetic agents continue to trend up. This figure was developed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which was published in 2019, and it does produce some alarming statistics. Some new statistics included in this document include how many people are using heroin for the first time or are misusing prescription opioids for the first time. I think it is safe to say the numbers are troubling and we all have to work together to continue to increase education on the dangers associated with these agents and also find ways to save lives in the event of an overdose. It is clear use of other substances such as alcohol or benzodiazepines with opioids increase the risk of overdose. The data on this slide was generated by a repeated cross-sectional analysis of the WONDER database, which included the analysis of the data from the CDC graphs that we just reviewed. In this study, all opioid-involved poisoning deaths from January 1st of 1999 to December 31st of 2017 were reviewed. It was reported that alcohol co-involvement averaged about 15% for all opioid overdoses with just a little variability within certain years. The black line represents overdose deaths, which included heroin and alcohol. Overdose deaths involving prescription opioids and alcohol represent the blue line. Although alcohol co-involvement averaged approximately 15% over the study period, benzodiazepines co-involvement with opioid overdose deaths has generally seen an increase over the years, particularly when looking at the blue line, which represents prescription opioids, and the orange line, which represents methadone. It is important to screen for use of benzodiazepines and or alcohol in patients who are taking opioids since it's clear there is an increased risk for using these substances together. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has outlined five strategies to prevent overdose deaths. As you can see, strategy one is to encourage providers, persons at high risk, family members, and others to learn how to pre prevent and manage opioid overdoses. Strategy two, ensure access to treatment for individuals who are misusing or addicted to opioids or have other substance use disorders. Strategy three, ensure ready access to naloxone. Strategy four, encourage the public to call 911. Strategy five, encourage prescribers to use the state PDMP. And we are gonna focus a little bit today on encouraging ready access to naloxone in terms of diving into what these products are and how to use them appropriately. So what is naloxone? Well, naloxone hydrochloride is a synthetic enolyl derivative of oxymorphone. It works as a mu opioid receptor antagonist at the mu receptor, but also has competitive inhibitory action at the delta and kappa opioid receptors as well. This agent works to reverse cardiovascular and respiratory depression caused by opioid overdoses by no knocking the opioids off the receptor for approximately 30 to 90 minutes. Naloxo produces no analgesic or euphoric effects, and it has no potential for abuse. Administering naloxo to a patient who is not taking opioids will not have a response. Naloxo can be administered various ways, including intravenously, subcutaneously, intramuscularly, or intranasally, to name a few. 
As mentioned already, naloxone is a short-acting drug. The effect wears off in about 30 to 90 minutes, depending on the dose and the route of administration. It is important to remember naloxone is fairly short acting, especially when you're considering some of the opioids that could be involved in these opioid overdoses, which have extended durations of action. Examples of these agents can include methadone, buprenorphine, extended release morphine, or extended release oxycodone, because any of these could have effects as long as 12 hours. Additionally, higher doses of naloxone have been needed for fentanyl products and buprenorphine, to name a few. This is one of many reasons it is vital that 911 is called when naloxone is administered so the patient can receive proper care as soon as possible. So what are some of the adverse reactions associated with naloxone? The adverse reactions of naloxone in general are expected based on the mechanism. If a patient is currently physically dependent on opioids, use of naloxone can precipitate abrupt opioid withdrawal. Common symptoms associated with withdrawal include body aches, fever, sweating, runny nose, restlessness, irritability, nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea, just to name a few. Pain can also increase since the pain relieving effects of the opioids will be reversed with the administration of naloxone. In general, the safety of using naloxone in an overdose situation has been established, but it is important to remember there are several case reports on perioperative patients treated with relatively high doses of naloxone who develop pulmonary edema, hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, possibly including cardiac arrest. These effects are related to the release of catecholamines after naloxone administration and occur predominantly in patients with hemodynamic instability. Despite these reports, naloxone has been proven in clinical practice to be effective, and it is well established as the first choice to use in life-threatening opioid-induced respiratory depression. So who should receive naloxone, particularly those take-home naloxone products we will discuss shortly? I think many agree that naloxone should be considered for all patients who have the chance of an opioid exposure. There are overdose education and naloxone distribution programs which train the laypersons in the use of these agents. This can include pa patients or people who are exposed to various types of opioids, family members, and peers, which might have to serve as those possible responders in the event of an opioid overdose emergency. Training includes recognition of signs and symptoms of overdose, the proper use of naloxone, and the recovery steps that need to be taken after the naloxone is administered. The CDC guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain suggests a way to mitigate risk is to co-prescribe naloxone for patients who are at risk for overdose. The listed patients include patients with a history of overdose, patients with a history of substance abuse, opioid use with doses greater than 50 milligrams of morphine equivalents, and concurrent use of benzodiazepines. I have highlighted these patient groups in green. Many states have included guidance for naloxone prescribing, so it is important for you to know what your state laws are regarding this topic. Now, as you will see, there are many other patient groups listed in this list, and I've compiled this using the references listed at the bottom of the slide. It includes many patients with very, various different disease states. Other specific issues, such as patients who are known or suspected of alcohol use. Patients who are taking extended release or long-acting medications. And also those patients who are undergoing an opioid rotation to a new opioid, because this is a very dangerous time for them. And so they are very good candidates for a take-home naloxone device. There was an FDA drug safety communication released in July of 2020, which highlighted the importance of naloxone and provided a list of patients who are good candidates for naloxone devices. I want to highlight the fact that the FDA stressed that prescribing naloxone should be considered for patients who are living with children who are at risk for accidental ingestion or opioid overdose. It was even stressed to consider prescribing naloxone even if the patient is not receiving a prescription for an opioid, but is around someone that is. 
We're going to spend a considerable time on the Deloxo products and the education points associated with Deloxo. SAMHSA has provided an opioid overdose prevention toolkit, which is referenced at the bottom of the slide. These are the five essential steps for use. So as you will see, the first step is check for signs of opioid overdose. And I've listed those signs that we just discussed previously. Call help for 911. It is so important that we stress how important it is that patients are, are they are calling 911 and really saying that someone is unresponsive and not breathing. Give that specific information of where they're at and also let EMS know that Narcan is going to be given. Administer naloxone, which we will talk about those devices in just a minute. And then support the person's breathing, so supply that rescue breathing. And fifth, monitor the person's response. It's important to stress that this could take about two to three minutes for the naloxone to take effect. And monitor for at least four hours after the naloxone has been administered and stress the effects of the long acting opioids and the fact that naloxone will not stay and have effect for as long as those various opioids could have in that patient. So let's look at these naloxone products. There's actually three FDA approved forms of naloxone, the ejectable, the auto ejector, and the nasal spray. All three forms of naloxone are FDA approved and may be considered as options for community distribution and use by individuals with or without medical training to stop or reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. We are now gonna spend some time discussing these products, including pr providing a demonstration on how these products are used. So this first product is the naloxone intranasal spray. And so you'll see that this is a kit that is developed where we give two of the two milligram naloxone per two of all pre-filled needleless syringes and two atomizers. I've given you the directions there and also a written out uh, explanation of how this is used for administration. However, we do have a great video that was available on YouTube where a pharmacist produces uh, a demonstration on how to use these products. So we will now go to her for this demonstration on this product. This is intranasal naloxone in a pre-filled syringe and it requires a nasal atomizer for administration. Each box contains one dose of naloxone and when you open it up, it looks like this. Now the first step to assemble your dose is to remove all the colored caps. So there's two yellow caps on the syringe and one purple cap on the drug vial. So now that all the color is gone, we can twist the drug vial onto the syringe. And the most important thing to remember at this point is not to push on the vial at all while you're twisting. This causes some of the drug to leak out of the end. So you wanna twist without pushing until you meet resistance. And then you'll take the nasal atomizer and twist it onto the other end until you meet resistance. And now your dose is ready for administration. There's two important things to remember when giving a dose of intranasal naloxone. The first thing is that we're gonna try and split the dose between both nostrils. This means you're gonna give half the dose in one nostril and half the dose in the other nostril. Now, <laughs> there is no way to accurately measure half a dose of naloxone. There's no mechanism on the device that will stop you halfway, so you're gonna have to estimate, and it's okay if it's not perfect. Just do your best to administer half the dose in one nostril, half the dose in the other nostril. The second thing to remember is to push vigorously on the drug vial when you give your dose. This allows the medication to form a fine mist that is easily absorbed in our sinuses. If you press too gently on the vial, the medication forms droplets at the syringe and it does not absorb as well in our sinuses. So push vigorously and give half the dose in one nostril, half the dose in the other nostril. Firmly place the applicator into the patient's nostril so that a seal forms, and vigorously push half the dose in one nostril and half the dose into the second nostril. 
And that's how you use intranasal naloxone in a pre-filled syringe. Okay, moving on to the naloxone intramuscular kits. So as you will see here, we have two naloxone 0.4 milligram per ml vials with two intramuscular syringes. There is also a multi-dose vial that could be supplied as well. So you'll see there, they give the written out directions on how to use these intramuscular uh, injection, injections of the naloxone. So let's move to the demonstration again. Injectable naloxone comes in a one milliliter single dose vial, similar to this one, and it can be given intramuscularly in the patient's deltoid on their upper arm, their quadricep on the outer aspect of their thigh, or their gluteal muscle on the upper portion of their backside. To prepare a dose, we'll first remove the plastic cap from the vial and grab your needle and syringe. Now, since we're injecting this medication, we want to try and keep the rubber cap and the tip of the needle clean, so avoid touching those as you prepare your dose. Remove the cap from your needle and insert it into the rubber stopper. Now you'll withdraw the full contents of the vial. There should be at least one milliliter of fluid and maybe slightly more due to overfill, but withdraw the full contents. Now we'll get rid of any bubbles by sharply tapping the syringe and removing any air so that we're left with one milliliter of liquid. Now your dose is ready for administration. Today I'll demonstrate how to give a dose of injectable naloxone in a patient's deltoid muscle. When giving an intramuscular injection, you'll first remove the patient's clothing to expose the skin. Feel for the bony edge of the patient's shoulder, place two fingers beneath that, and the triangular area here is the deltoid muscle, and that's where you'll be giving the injection. If available, clean the area with an alcohol swab. Then, pinch the muscle to form a firm surface. Insert the needle at a 90 degree angle and inject the dose of medication. Remove the needle and dispose of it properly. Do not recap your needle. Now that the dose has been given, the patient should start to respond within three to five minutes. However, if they're not responding, it is safe to give a second dose of naloxone in an alternate injection site if you have another dose available. For more specific questions on how to locate an intramuscular injection site or how to choose the correct size needle, feel free to check in with your pharmacist or doctor. And that's how you give a dose of injectable naloxone. Our third section is the Loxone Intranasal Spray. This is a twin pack device, a set of devices that are available commercially. And so you'll see the directions listed. And I've also given you the lay responder Narcan administration that was developed by Overdose Lifeline. We now will have a demonstration on the proper use of the Narcan nasal spray. This is Narcan nasal spray. It comes in a box with two doses. You're gonna take one dose out of the box, remove it from the packaging, and the applicator goes in one nostril, and you're gonna depress the plunger with a quick, firm push. When putting in the applicator, you'll wanna form a tight seal at the patient's nose so that the medication goes up into the sinuses and does not come down the face. And then with a quick, firm push, you're gonna administer the medication. There's no need to depress the other nostril. You can leave it open. And if a second dose is needed, you will apply it in the other nostril than the one that the first dose was given in. And that's how you use the Narcan nasal spray. Now we'll have the naloxone intramuscular auto ejector. This also is commercially available. It comes in a twin pack and there is a generic now available which has helped with cost, although it's still fairly expensive. And so I've listed all the steps of use. The interesting thing of this device is it'll actually talk you through it. So there's an automated voice that once you activate it, it will start telling you exactly what to do for the proper administration of naloxone. 
Let's take a look at the demonstration. Evzio is injectable naloxone that comes in a box similar to this, and each box contains two doses of active drug and one training device. Today, I'll be using the training device to show you how it works, and I highly recommend when you get your box of Evzio to open it up, take out that trainer, and give it a try. That way you can see what it sounds like, see what it feels like, and you can always be prepared in an opioid overdose situation. So the trainer, it's a white cartridge. You remove it from the case and it starts speaking to you. This trainer contains no needle or drug. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. To inject, place black end against outer thigh, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five. Four, three, two, one. Injection complete. And as you can see, it does a great job walking you through how to give a dose of naloxone so all the work is done for you. And that is Evzio. Okay, I hope you enjoyed those demonstrations. Again, that video is available on YouTube if you would like to watch it again at any time. And so the last thing I did for these products was I created a table so you could compare each one of these products. So uh, I included pretty much everything that you need to know in regards to these products. So naloxone education is so important, and it's not something that you do just once. It's a continual process with your patients. But that first time that you're talking to the patient about naloxone, I think it's really important on how you approach the subject of naloxone. So basically, there's various recommendations out there of how to do this because there are some barriers associated with Narcan or any of the naloxone products. So I always ask the patient before I even bring up naloxone if they actually have a fire alarm or a fire extinguisher in their house. Hopefully everyone says, of course, because we all know how important it is to have these in our house. So my next question to that is, well, if you have those in your house, does that mean that you want a fire? And their response traditionally is, of course not, it's for safety. And I'm like, absolutely. And I said, so basically I have something for you today since you are getting a prescription for an opioid that is going to be your fire extinguisher in case something goes terribly wrong. And so then I go into discussing what naloxone is, but this seems to be a great way to open up this discussion so that they see that we're giving them something that hopefully they never will need, but it's there just in case, just like our fire extinguisher or fire alarm. Okay, so I, this is basically a table that goes through all the different things that we talk about when we're educating our patients. And so, of course, the introduction is very important, but part of that is also going through how the medication works. And also, we stress the fact that naloxone is an opioid antagonist. And so that does help restore spontaneous respiration in the event of an opioid overdose, but it's also important to explain why you feel the naloxone is important to have available in case of an emergency. And I always stress that it allows that gift of time, that it basically allows emergency services to get there and have a better chance of helping a patient that's in, in trouble in regards to an opioid overdose. Also, I think all during this time, we talk about the sides of opioid overdose, just as we did at the beginning of this presentation. Patients really should be educated on the fact that the naloxone is effective if opioids are misused in combination with other sedatives or stimulants. It is not effective in treating overdoses with just when the overdose is just like a benzodiazepine or a stimulant involving cocaine or amphetamines. So that's a very important counseling point. It should also be stressed that naloxone is not a replacement for medical care. It is vital that 911 is called, even if the patient responds quickly to the first dose. I usually stress why naloxone is that gift of time. It, as I mentioned, it gives more time for those emergency services to arrive. 
There is a good time. This is a good time to also stress that some of the opioids work longer in the body, so patients can start to experience symptoms of overdose again. The directions for use depend on what device you're going to recommend for the patient. The side effects should be discussed, including the fact that naloxo can cause withdrawal in patients who are opioid dependent. Re-administration parameters should be covered and remind the patient there are two devices available in the commercially available take-home naloxo kits. If the patient does not start breathing in two to three minutes, then a second dose can be administered. And finally, a discussion regarding proper rescue maneuvers should be covered, including rescue breathing, chest compressions, and the proper recovery position to prevent aspiration. I have some other uh, education points that I really like to cover as well. I always stress to them that the device has to be stored in an easily accessible area. I always explain to them that if they're down and they can't help themselves and somebody needs to help them, they need to be able to get to that naloxo device. So this is also a good time to talk about how important it is to lock up the, the, any types of medications, but that naloxo needs to be left out where your family members or caregivers know where to access, access it in case of an emergency. We talk about how important it is to store at room temperature. As I always tell them, just remember, if you're comfortable, it is comfortable. It does not go in the car where the heat will get to it and cause damage. Trade all family and caregivers on the proper use of this device. That should be a discussion that you have with the proper people in your family uh, so they are aware of where it is and how it's used appropriately. And of course, Re returning to the importance of calling 911 for help. We also check the expiration date. We stay on top of this because this is an area that I have found quite frequently that a patient does get an Arcan inhaler or the injectable device. And then uh, I notice that it's been 12 months to 18 months later. And so we do need to keep an eye on that expiration date and uh, make sure that we also are re-educating during this time as well. I like to use little pop quizzes during uh, patient education, and so I ask them if they think it's safe to use on a child or a pet, and so it is based on labeling, and so I think that's a good discussion with them, and one thing I always say is sometimes the unimaginable happens, and there's something that goes wrong, and what if you drop a pill and a child gets a hold of it, and so this again is some good reason, if you have opioids in the house, that you should have the naloxone device available as well, just in case something happens. Per labeling, pregnant women can be given naloxone in limited doses under the physician's supervision. And lastly, it's important to stress to them that naloxone has no effect in people who are not taking opioids. So I just explained to them that if they think somebody's down due to nalox or due to an opioid overdose, that if they administer naloxone and they're actually not on opioids, it doesn't have any effect on that patient. Naloxone access laws have been developed to improve and expand naloxone access to anyone through various means rather than via prescription from a prescriber. Prior to the naloxone access laws, only prescribers could authorize dispensing of naloxone. There, was some also, there were also some barriers uh, in regards to prescribers and their concerns about liability, and that also thought that it could actually decrease the prescribing of naloxone. Aside from administration of a prescription by a prescriber directly to that patient, there are standing orders which allow distribution of naloxone. Additionally, there are laws that allow distribution of naloxone without a prescription through overdose education and naloxone distribution programs and pharmacies. Certain states such as California, Alaska, South Carolina, and Oklahoma, just to give you an example, give pharmacists direct authority to dispense naloxone to anyone who requests it. It is important to remember that naloxone access laws vary based on state. So it's very, very important that you check your state laws so you're aware of that. There was a recent study by ABOC uh, published in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2019. They evaluated the effectiveness of the naloxone access laws in regards to reducing fatal overdoses involving opioids. 
This was a population-based study which found that the states who adopted the Loxone access laws, which allowed pharmacists direct dispensing authority via prescriptive authority or dispensing the Loxone without a prescription to patients who requested it, did see a statistically significant reduction in fatal opioid-related overdoses. There was not much change in fatal overdoses in the states that only allowed indirect authority to dispense naloxone. Now, they did stress that more research will need to be done to follow these trends to see what's going on. Now, the article that I have referenced at the bottom of this slide outlined the six general topics covered by the naloxone access laws, which can vary by state. As you can see, naloxone can be dispensed to a person for use on other individuals. Naloxone can be dispensed to any patient who meets set criteria based on the specific state. There are also laws which allow individuals to carry naloxone without a prescription. In regards to civil and criminal immunity, there are laws which provide immunity to medical personnel who are prescribing or dispensing naloxone in good faith. Lay person dispensing of a naloxone is also permitted. This is just an example of some of the Florida and naloxone laws that I've pulled out for you to review. So you see there's the 911 Good Samaritan Act, which allows, it protects a person who seeks medical assistance in good faith for an individual experiencing drug-related overdose from charge, prosecution, or other penalties. It also protects the overdose victim. Secondly, you see the Emergency Treatment and Recovery Act. This allows uh, first responders to possess, store, and administer naloxone. It also allows patients and caregivers uh, authorization to administer opioid antagonists to a person they believe is in an overdose situation. Uh, it also allows uh, healthcare uh, practitioners to prescribe and pharmacists to dispense emergency opioid antagonists to patients and caregivers. And you see the Naloxo bill also, this allowed pharmacists uh, the ability to dispense Naloxo without a prescription. The details are below. So has Naloxo dispensing increased? Well, based on the data from this publication, naloxone prescriptions have increased substantially from 2012 to 2018. They also found that naloxone dispensing is improving in all areas, but continues to be three times more likely to be a low dispensing county compared to the metropolitan counties. It was reported there is definitely room for improvement in those prescriptions that are considered high-dose opioid prescriptions. High-dose opioid prescriptions are defined at opioid doses greater than 50 milligrams of morphine equivalents per day. This was based on the CDC guidelines, which were published in 2016. It was reported that naloxo prescriptions dispensed for one, or I'm sorry, one naloxo prescription dispensed for every 60 high-dose opioids. So we definitely have room for improvement here. So in general, Deloxo does provide some time in opioid overdose situations and it definitely can save lives. I found this quote a long time ago that has really stuck with me. Nobody dies from Narcan, they die from not getting Narcan. I think about this all the time when I'm evaluating a patient who is receiving an opioid prescription. There are many patients out there who have opioids in their house and it's always report, important to remember the risk of an opioid overdose is there. Providing Narcan and educating the patient and caregivers on the importance and proper use can provide that extra time for medical assistance in the event of an opioid overdose emergency. Thank you for your time.